Acts 27, and this is, to me, just such an encouraging passage. I, we talked about it this morning, and uh, I love it because you can't make something like this up. And I love it that God included the detail about the events in the apostles' life because so often our lives are very filled with drama. And sometimes we get the idea when we're having just setback after setback after setback, and you think, oh, I'm sincere, I think. I'm just trying to do this thing, and I want it to, I'm just trying to bless somebody, and, and just one thing after another after another. And you can somehow feel like, man, am I alone, or is this unique, or what did I do wrong, or why does God hate me, or who stuck the kick me sign on my back? Like, why am I just this target repeatedly? Um, but I think God included this so you'd realize, hey, man, you're just like the Apostle Paul. Because all this whole section started because Paul wanted to get money from the Gentile believers and take it to the poverty believers in Jerusalem and bless the church. You guys are suffering. We got some resources. We love you guys. We just want to come and say we love you. All this stuff that's happened up to this point, a a beating, I mean, really kind of a misunderstanding. I mean, the legalism of the church in Jerusalem and wanting them to do this, you know, pay for these guys' offering and then being beaten in the temple, but then being held as a political prisoner for at least two years, and then uh, you know, being, having to appeal to Caesar, and then going, and then now he's on the boat. He's going to Caesar. He's appealed to Caesar. He knows he's not going to be treated fairly or justly uh, by these corrupt governors. <clears throat> so they begin to sail to Rome. It was a Roman citizen's right. Paul had Roman citizenship. A Roman citizen not getting a fair shake anywhere in the empire could say, I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Caesar. And they're like, okay, you're going to Caesar. So off to Caesar he goes. So chapter 27, it was decided, uh, when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. And entering a ship of Adramitium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia, and Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. Now, so you see it's first person. So who's writing this book? It's Luke. So who's traveling with Paul to Rome? Is Luke. He's part of this. And Aristarchus is with them also, and they're making their way. Now today, if I said, hey, you want, who wants to go on a sail in the Mediterranean, and we'll take off from Haifa and we'll just sail across to Italy. That's called a cruise ship, baby. That's awesome. Is it all inclusive? Like, I mean, are we going to do some snorkeling? What are we going to do? That would be awesome. I'm telling you right now, if if it was back then, I wouldn't go. I said, no thanks, I'll walk. Uh, I'll watch you guys shipwreck along the way. I am not getting in that little boat. The technology, the engineering of those days did not make the boats very seaworthy. They were... uh, not much more than kind of floating rafts. They were sort of, they, they had some buoyancy, but if there was any kind of torque put on the boat, the way they were constructed in the first century, it would cause the boat to twist and the boards would separate. Boards separating on a boat is not cool, okay? And you will see that in a moment, what they, what they would do to try to deal with it because they get torque on the boat and they had a, the only thing, they had like one last ditch effort and they would strap ropes or chains around it and just kind of try to cinch it and hold it together. If you're wrapping chains around your boat to hold it together, that's not good. So I wouldn't have gone. I mean, Paul's a prisoner. He doesn't have a choice. He's going to uh, Rome. So uh, the next day, verse 3, we landed at Sidon. So they're going up the coast from Caesarea. Uh, They're not all the way to Haifa. They're just making their way and sailing along the coast. Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. And when we put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And then when we sailed over the sea, which is off of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. So you see how this works? You got the merchant marine, the merchant ships are going. This is not a Roman navy operation. The Romans just come up and they go, you got space? And the guy's like, no, I'm packed. All right. And, the guy, and they're marching on your boat already. So they take the one boat as far as it goes, and then they jump off, and then the guy finds another boat that's going all the way. It's coming from Alexandria, Egypt. It's saying all the way around the Mediterranean up to Rome. This is a big deal. It's probably representing uh, you know, a big chunk of a year's worth of, of, uh, of labor 
in the hall that they're taking up there. So it's come from Alexandria. It's going all the way to Italy. Put us on board. Verse 7, it didn't go well. We sailed slowly for many days. We arrived with difficulty off Snidus, and the wind was not permitting us to proceed. We sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmone. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lacia. Now this city was appropriately named in that they're about to enter the danger zone, and this is a great place to stop. It's the Fair Havens. So this, this is a good spot. The, if, you, if you go at the wrong time of the year and you go further, you're going to get hammered. So um, they had spent time there, <clears throat> getting to there, verse 9, much time had been spent, and the sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. So Paul um, who had already been, or at some, he says he's been shipwrecked three times when he tells his story in 2 Corinthians. He'd been shipwrecked three times. So Paul knows a little bit about shipwrecks. This is one of his shipwrecks. We don't know when the other ones occurred. But he tells them, <clears throat> verse 10, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. However, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken of by Paul. Now, the owner of the ship, is he an unbiased source? Do you want to wait a year to get paid, or do you want to get paid in a month and a half when we get there? Uh, it's, it's good sailing. Let's do it. We could make it. Um, so these guys say, no, we can do it. So the centurions are, right, let's press. So verse 12, the harbor was not suitable to winter in. That's a code word for the, the soldiers don't, and the sailors don't want to stay there because there's no casinos. I just, right? Why do people want to stay where they want to stay? It's not suitable. It's not really a great place. If, if we're going to stay, we want to stay in a place where we can be sailors and soldiers. It wasn't suitable to winter in. The majority said we should sail from there. If by any means we could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete. Uh, why would they want to stay in Crete? Remember what Paul said to Titus, the proverb about the people who lived in Crete? They're lazy. They're gluttons. Hey, that's where I want to go, man. It's a place where you just eat and lay down all day. So let's get to Crete so we can hang out. We'll winter there. So verse 13, here's how sometimes it works. You got some stupid idea, and you go, look, the Lord's in it. Because watch verse 13. Now, they're not Christians, but this is how the flesh works. When the south wind blew softly, supposing they'd obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. How many times when we've got some desire and we push for it and we go, look, the wind's blowing just the right way. Well, what did, you know, Paul says, I don't think we should do it. And no, no, look, it's, look, it's confirmation, man. The soft wind's blowing. I can get what I want. Sometimes people think that things going the way that they want is actually God telling them what to do. Remember, Paul said, there's an open door and there are many adversaries. Sometimes people think, well, I've got it. it's an open door because there are no adversaries. No, Paul said sometimes the open door is where the adversaries are. Sometimes the closed door is where the soft, gentle wind is blowing. So how do you know the will of God? You get your Bible and you read it, and you test what you think the Lord's telling you to do with what the principles of Scripture, either written, what it, like are you violating what God's actually said, or is what you're thinking about doing in line with what God said? Is it in, is it in line with his character and what he does? Not the, soft, not the soft wind, because we can deceive ourselves. So this is a good example. Now, these guys aren't Christians, but it's just a great picture of the flesh. They feel the wind blowing. They say, man, this is it. We need to do it. But look at, so often the case, verse 14, what happens to us? Not long after that, a tempestuous headwind arose that has a name, the Euroclidon. So this guy is a notorious wind. That's why Paul knew they shouldn't go. You've you got to get from point A to point B before a part of the year because that's when the weather pattern changes and there's a wind that'll come and you will not make it across there. They don't have the ability with those boats to go into a headwind and tack back and forth and put a lot of torque on the hull of the ship. If they did that, the boat would come apart. So they're kind of left with kind of motoring straight with where the wind's blowing and they're kind of stuck. They can't they can't put a lot of pressure on the boat. We can now, like you could say it, like they guys sail in crazy winds now and they tack back and forth, but they put a ton of torque on the boat, but the engineering's totally different. The way they, those boats were engineered, all the torque would go on the centerpiece and it would just twist the boats apart. So 
they can't do anything when this wind kicks up. So they're, they're I mean, when that happens, they're busted. It's, it's done. Verse 15, then the ship was caught and they could not head into the wind, so they let her drive. That means the wind is going to blow them. So then they ran under the shelter of an island called Clauda, and they secured the skiff with difficulty. So you can imagine what that looked like. The boat's going crazy, the skiff's flying around, and they're blowing, and they're just getting hammered. Um, verse 17, they took it on board, and then here's that passage I told you about, about what they would do. It says, then they used cables to undergird the ship. So when that torque would begin to twist the boat apart, water began to come through. This It's just not a good situation. Last-ditch effort is you throw a rope around, a big heavy rope or some kind of chain, and you'd wrap it around the boat and try to pull it tight so you essentially loop around the boat and try to cinch it. I would say, though, that that's kind of like survival, right? If you wouldn't go buy a boat with chains wrapped around it, would you? Like... You probably wouldn't. You're like, hey, I can't wait to take this out into the bay. <laughs> what are the chains for? I heard this thing comes apart when the wind's blowing. Oh, I ain't going with you, Gilligan. Even if you got a skipper and a professor and a millionaire. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Whatever. So off they go. Um, they undergird the ship. They were afraid lest it should run aground on this area they knew where it got shallow. They struck the sail. They took the sail down and just let the boat be blown along. Verse 18, because we're exceedingly tempest-tossed. What does that mean? The boat doesn't have a sail. So what's the boat doing? What does the surf look like? What are the swells doing? They're in a boat with no... They don't have a motor, you guys. Are they rowing? You can't row. What are they doing? They're just spinning and rolling over the hills of the ocean waves. And they're just going wherever the wind blows them and wherever the current takes them. And so what's happening? They've chained their boat already. And then uh, their tempest-tossed water's coming in the boat. So they're bailing water to try to get it out. We know there's a problem because look at the next sentence. The next day they lightened the ship. Now why would you need to do that? The ship is beginning to get heavy, and as it goes down, it's losing its buoyancy, which makes it more susceptible to more water coming in, which is now compounding the problem. The more water comes in, the lower you go. The lower you go, the more water comes in. That's not good. So now you start throwing stuff out to make yourself more buoyant. So look what they throw out. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. So when the sailors come by and go, grab the sail, boys. The sail? Chuck it. <laughs> okay. Grab all the ropes and the block and the tackle. Well, wait, like that's how we go. <laughs> throw the tackle overboard. Throw this. Throw everything overboard. So they're throwing the stuff you use to make the boat work. Now, can you imagine if you're driving in a car like that? Car's not doing good. You're coming down from the grapevine. Hey, I don't know. You know, throw the back seat out. <laughs> you're like, oh. I mean, that's not a good sign. Get the visors. Throw them. You know. I mean, it's just weird to think of. I mean, it's, it's, this is desperate. You can't read the Bible. It, it's, so, it's so warm and cozy, and you just feel comfortable when you're reading it. What does this look like if this is happening to you? And, and the boat is sinking is what's happening, and they're throwing stuff out. But notice he said the third day. That's a day and a night and a day and a night and a day and a night. I mean, this, they're going through this through the night. They're not sleeping. It's difficult. Verse 20, listen to this. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we should be saved was finally given up. Now, we're not close to the end of the story, but many days have gone on, and we've thrown over what we can throw overboard, and it, we're going to, like, we're just, it's inevitable. We're not going to make it, and we haven't seen the start. They, they have no idea where they are. These guys don't have GPS. They, they navigate by where the sun is. They navigate by where the stars are. And they can tell by taking a latitude of where, the, where they are in relation to the constellations of where they are. They can't do that. They have no idea where this thing's blowing them. Now, verse 21. This is where we picked up this morning. Uh, after a long... And I skipped this verse on purpose, and I'll, you'll see why right now, because it would distract from the message this morning, but I'm not worried about distracting you tonight. 
Verse 21, after a long abstinence of food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, and this, in my flesh, this is my favorite Bible verse. Paul said, men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. This is the biblical I told you so. <laughs> so if you're a person who loves the I told you so, Paul is your friend. Now don't now say, Paul said, imitate me, and so I'm going to now say, I'm just going to glory in I told you so. Paul, Paul saying this is just like when you say it. Uh, you guys should have listened to me. Well, this is the precursor to an angel spoke to me last night and said we're all going to live. So don't start off, hey, God spoke to me and said what's going to happen with an I told you so, should have listened to me, but he's a human. Jesus is our Savior, not Paul, right? Jesus is the only one without sin. Um, Paul here, I, I think he's in the flesh maybe, at least a little bit, or, or maybe um, a lot. Probably, you know, it's got to be, this isn't right ever. But you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster. Now I urge you, though, to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. And we pointed out this morning the significance of those statements. Every person, those are the two most important questions, you know, who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Do you belong to alcohol? Do you belong to partying? Do you belong to your friends? Do you belong, do you belong to your boyfriend? Do you belong to your girlfriend? Do you, do you belong to your job? Who do you belong to? And you know, the only person worthy of you is God himself. That's, that's who we are. We're, we're human beings created in the image of God, created for God. You belong to God. He bought you. He redeemed you. He gave something to get something. He gave him his life to get us. He made us his own special people. So we belong to God. Then the second one, and it's never the first, it's always the second, is who do you, you know, I serve him. What's the purpose of my life? So first you need to understand I belong to God. Then secondly, you, belonging to God, out of that has to come that purpose of your life. Are you here to make money? I sure hope not because what a disappointment. What a disappointment to lay in your coffin with a million dollars with a fake smile that got put on your face by an undertaker and they put makeup on your dead carcass while you're not even there and your money gets buried in the ground to rot. What, do you, I mean, what, what would you live for? What's worth living for? But to find your identity in God, your relationship with God, I belong to God, and then out of that relationship to come a purpose for my life. Lord, what are you doing with my life? What is my life about? What do, you, what do you have planned? What do you want to do? Let's do it. Because when a person knows they belong to God and they know why they're created and they're living for it, that person truly is alive. And, and for even the believers, believers that understand and know that God bought them and they belong to God, but they're still in this kind of lukewarm state or they've left their first love, or just you can just get out of sorts by missing out on, you know, what's the purpose of my life? Believers living for self or living for some other passion. But allowing God and that identity in I belong to God to produce in me some vision for a calling of God in my life. And I'm not talking about full-time ministry. I'm talking about whatever God's called you to. That's full-time ministry and that all of us are full-time in the ministry. Right? You know, I, I, I don't get to come home and say, hey, honey, I'm off the clock. Those people pay me to serve them. If you want me to serve, you better start paying. I mean, you don't, you don't, when do you serve? You just say, hey, we're serving the Lord, right? So I'm not talking about being a missionary or a pastor or something, but finding the purpose for your life. So key. Paul tells them that. His relationship with God, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, came to me and said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Now God had already told Paul you testified before me in Jerusalem, now you're going to testify before me in Rome. So Paul already had this word, but it would seem that now after many days, no sail, blowing in the wind, no stars at night, that even Paul's thinking, what in the world's happening? But God came with, a, with an angel and reminded him, remember I told you, you're going to Rome and everybody on the boat's going to live. What a great word and what an encouraging thing to have God say to him. So he tells him this, because God said this to me, verse 25, Take heart, men, for I believe that it will be just as it was told me. 
Now, here's an interesting thing. What does it look like when Paul's saying this? It might look like this. Take heed, men. It, it will be just as it was told me. You know, they're on a boat in a storm while he's saying this, right? He's, he's going up. It'll be just as it was told me. And it, I mean, the boat, there's chains on the boat. They threw all the tackle overboard. Many days have passed. They have no idea where they are. They're going up and down the waves. So is Paul right? Well, if God said it, then it's going to happen. Okay, now you might look at the circumstance and say, there's no way that's going to happen. But God's word will always overcome any circumstance. Don't ever forget that. You can have circumstance on one side, what God said on the other. Put your money on what God said. You'll never regret it. Okay, put your life on it. You'll never regret it. Put your money on circumstances, you'll regret it. <laughs> Don't put your life on it for sure. It's God's word will always come true. So he tells them what's going to happen. God apparently told them this too. Verse 26, we will run aground on a certain island. So we're just, God's going to just let us blow, and we're going to blow right into an island. We're just going to, whoosh, and we're going to land. So uh, verse, tw- verse 27, uh, when the 14th night had come, so that's a bit of a time. You imagine being in a boat, just blowing in a storm for 14 nights. That'd be amazing. I mean, that would be unbearable and discouraging and challenging. How cold and wet you would be, how miserable, how hopeless, how discouraging uh, it would be as you're thinking, is this the night we die? Um, we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea at around midnight, The sailors, and this is interesting, the sailors sensed that they were being drawn near some land. How did they do that? You know, when you're you're in the middle, when you're good at something and it's just something you do all the time, you just start to tell, you know, it's shallow. How would you know? The the waves sound different. Maybe they start to hear the sound, there's a sound of surf off in the distance, or they're catching it before anybody else catches it. There's some kind of change, and they think, man, there's land near. They can't, it's midnight. you imagine you got no sail, you got no light, you got no GPS, you're in a boat that's just free, free blowing in the wind, and, and all of a sudden you realize, I think we're coming near land. That's not cool. So verse 28, here's what you do. Old school. They began to take soundings, and they found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they took soundings again, and they found it to be 15 fathoms. So it's getting shallower. They drop in a, probably a weight on a rope and... And they're like, oh, dude, <laughs> we're coming in, and it's nighttime. So verse 29, fearing that we would run aground on the rocks, we dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. There's that old saying, there's no atheist in a foxhole. So apparently in a shipwreck, there's no atheist either. Everybody begins, and Jonah's day, they were praying too. So they threw the anchors out and just said, hey, man, we'll just see if we can just hold it here through the night so that we can at least come ashore in the day. Look at verse 30. The sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, and when they let down the skiff into the, the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurions and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you can't be saved. Now watch, uh, they didn't listen to Paul before, but now it's, they're all about Paul. So the soldiers went and cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. Now imagine that. This is uh, Gilligan and the skipper leaving the professor and Marianne and Lovey and Thurston, uh, they're, they're, hey guys, you wait here. We're going to go put anchors on the front. They're going to get in the little boat and float off and good luck. I mean, they're going to bail on him. Apparently the captain doesn't go down with the ship. So Paul says, these guys, we're going to stick together. The soldiers cut the ropes and the boat's gone. So as it was about to be dawn, Paul begged them to take food, saying, today's now the 14th day you've watched and continued without food and you've eaten nothing. I urge you to take nourishment. This is for your survival since you... Not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. When he'd said these things, he took the bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he broke it, they began, he began to eat, and they were all encouraged, and they also took food. And in all, there were 276 people on the ship. So it's a big floating barge, essentially, coming from Alexandria, going up with a huge load, and, and they've already dumped it and... Uh, when we'd eaten enough, then they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. So that was the cash that was on the boat. They were going to sell it. Now that's gone. And when it was day, they didn't recognize the land, and they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. 
They let go of the anchors, left them in, uh, in the sea, and meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes, they hoisted a mainsail. They apparently had just enough sail left just to make one sail, and they uh, made for the shore. And here's the problem, verse 41. This is story just never ends. They're making, there's a bay, we can do it. They start heading, and they struck a place where the two seas met, and they ran the ship aground. And the prow struck fast and remained immovable. Now, here, if you think about a storm and waves coming, what makes a wave? A wave, a, a crashing wave happens when the height of the wave above the surface of the water, because it makes a trough, when the, when the ground comes up shallow and the distance between the surface and the land, the bottom, is less than the surface and the height. So if you come from deep water and it immediately comes shallow, what the wave goes, and you get them crazy, powerful wave just thumping. So if you're in a boat and you're out in a bay, they hit an outer reef. And what happens at an outer reef in a big storm? That's called Bonsai Pipeline. That's the North Shore of Hawaii. That's where you see those crazy waves. So I'm not saying that it's you know, some crazy Tahiti wave or whatever, but this is where in a storm and the waves are breaking and the outer reef, that's where their boat gets stuck, in the impact zone. That is not where you want to be, okay? So... They, they were heading in, and it looked good, and now it's bad again. So the, end, the back of the boat is being broken up by the violence of the waves. Verse 42, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get into land. And then the rest, and Mike Harris wanted to, me to remind you, verse 44, some on boards. There's, according to Mike, surfing in the Bible. They came in on boards and some on parts of the ship, and so it was that they all escaped safely to land. So everybody grabbed something that float, floated and made their way in, but everybody made it. Now, chapter 28, when they escaped, they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness. They kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on a fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. The locals knew what kind of snake it was. This snake bites you, you're a goner. And so they think, and this guy's a bad dude, you know, he got it, karma. You know, he escaped the sea, that storm might have been for him, and now he's going to get his, you know, that snake got him. Look at this story. I mean, this is unbelievable. It's very detailed. You think of all the things we could learn about, uh, the preaching of the gospel, the gospel penetrating other cultures, and we're getting this very detailed account of one bad thing after another bad thing after another bad thing. And what started all this? a great desire to take an offering and go to Jerusalem. And it's one thing after another, after another, after another. A man called to be an apostle who's been a prisoner now for over two years. He's on this boat. He's not done any crime. He's a prisoner. He's not guilty of any crime. There's not even a charge against him. It's a political thing. And now they got shipwrecked, but then they saw the island. Then they're going to go. Then they got stuck. Then they're going to crash. Then the guys are going to kill him. Then they escape. Then they get on the land. Then he gets bit by a snake. And you think, oh, my goodness. It's like watching a tennis match. Like, what is, like what's happening here? He lives, though. And when he didn't die, they're watching him, waiting for it to happen. They looked at him for a long time and saw no harm come to him. And they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Well, he didn't die. He must be a god. Well, they were wrong. He's not god. But God was protecting him. In that region, there was an estate of a lead, the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius. He received us and entertained us courteously for three days. It happened that the father of Publius was sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. And when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came, and they were healed. And they honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Now, think about this. There's a group of guys on a boat that are making their way around the first century world from Alexandria up to Rome with a cargo, and a Roman soldier with his prisoners gets on their boat. 
and think of how their lives changed and that God loved those guys that much that he sent Paul and his companions to be on their boat. And they went through maybe one of the worst experiences of their life and they got to see God deliver them through all this craziness. How many of those guys do you think got saved? It doesn't say that they did. You sure get the idea that Lucius, because he says his name, the Roman guy who's in charge who like wants to save Paul, you get the idea that something's going on with that guy, that and that guy, he, he's being impacted. Well, then they, Paul doesn't die from the snake bite. You don't think that affects? There's 276 people on the boat. Paul shakes off the snake, and they're like, that guy didn't even, like, what is this? An angel spoke to him. We just lived. Nobody died. Exactly like he said, God's doing a work in these guys' lives. God loves people, and sometimes our circumstances go a certain way, and it puts us in contact with people that we would never get in contact with. And we don't get to choose how God's going to use us. Paul originally had a desire to go to Rome. He's getting to Rome, and <laughs> not exactly the way he thought. So God might tell you, hey, I'm going to use you. And you say, great. Billy Graham? You know, no more like Job. You know, I use Job to encourage people who suffer for, you know, the whole millennium. You know, it's, one of the old, it's the oldest book in the Bible, maybe. So uh, I want to, no, no, not Job. How about Daniel? No, no, not Daniel either. Uh, how about Joseph? Not him either. Well, who do you want to be? Um, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> You know, who did, who did God use that didn't have suffering? You know, like that's just part of it. So God's using this, this whole thing in an amazing way, and, and they have a huge impact through the shipwreck on that island. So then verse 11, it was three months, and after three months we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, and they had wintered at that island. And then we landed at Syracuse, and we stayed there three days, and from there we circled round and we reached Regium. After one day, the south wind blew, and then the next day we came to uh, Puteoli, and we found brethren there, so there's some Christians there, and we were invited to stay with them for seven days. Now, who's invited to stay with the Christians for seven days? Paul and Luke and Aristarchus. Well, who are they traveling with? Well, they're new friends, the Roman soldiers. <laughs> Think about when he says, we're invited to stay with them. Well, who's staying there? Lucius has given him permission, or they're just all there. Maybe they're all brothers. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't say that they are, but it says that's where we stayed. So it's interesting to me. They're making their way up. Uh, they're, un they're, they're under the, the guardianship of these Romans, but that's just an interesting story how it unfolds. So then, verse 15, from, um, from there, when the brethren heard about us, I'm sorry, uh, we, we stayed with them for seven days and then we went towards Rome. Then verse 15, from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as uh, the AP Forum and the three inns. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. And Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. You think about what a privilege it would be to be a soldier guarding Paul. I mean, what would you give to spend eight hours a day with the Apostle Paul? It's like, Paul, what else happened? <laughs> Tell me something else. So it came to pass after three days, and now he's settled. Paul called for the leaders of the Jews, and when they came together, he said, Men and brethren, though I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they examined me, they wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. When the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Remember Paul's practice was always to go to the Jew first and to the Gentile. When he was free, he would go to the synagogue. Well, now he's got liberty. He can have guests and people come and go. So he's, can I get the Jewish leaders to come over? And they get there, and he's going to share the gospel with them. Like, hey... I'm not here because i got a beef. You know, this is what happened. So then they say, uh, verse 21, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. We desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it's spoken against everywhere. So we think about the church today and what we might be facing and where we're headed, and even just in the last week, just the way you know, things are rolling. Well, the early church, you know the world they lived in? 
It was a world filled with sexual immorality, godlessness, idolatry, and here's the testimony in Rome by Jews well into the, the you know, after 50 AD, it's years into the uh, second part of the first century, and, and here's their take on it. This sect is spoken of for evil everywhere. So Satan's turned it on on the, on the church. Did it kill the church? Did it stop the church? No, because the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. And there's an old saying, and it's always been true, and it goes back to the early days of the church, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So the more the persecution comes, the more the church spreads. So um, here's the testimony. It's not much different than today. So when he, they appointed for him a day, verse 23 uh, many came to him at his house to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. So these guys were knowledgeable of the Old Testament. It was their book, um, I mean, their, their compilation of books. They knew the law. They knew what the prophets said. Well, Paul was a rabbi. He knew what the law said. And now he's going to go to the scriptures. One of them would have been what we use tonight, Psalm 22. He had gone to that and said, listen, Jesus said from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, let's walk through the psalm, you guys. You believe in the psalm? It was written a thousand, it's our song. Now here's what Jesus said. Here's what happened to him. Tell me that doesn't apply to him. He'd go right to Isaiah 53. He'd go back to Abraham. They'd say, well, let me go to Abraham. He'd go back to Abraham. In Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, how does that happen? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He's just going through the scriptures and he's sharing with them who Jesus is. And some were persuaded, verse 24, by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. And when they couldn't agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said this one word. And here's how kind of the book of Acts ends. Paul said, The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear, and you won't understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they've closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn it so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And when he'd said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So he would be under what we would call house arrest. He was given permission. He he engaged a lodging. He had someone guarding him. He he was accountable to, and, uh, and yet he had some liberty, but he couldn't leave. He was waiting. So how many years? Not allowed to travel. At least two years held in Caesarea, two more years in Rome. Four years, someone who's called, someone sent out, an apostle. If, if your identity gets in what you're doing, and your identity becomes what you're doing, you're going to end up disappointed in your life. Because your identity is not what you do. The God to whom I belong, there's my identity. What I do, well, that could be whatever God wants to do. For right now, it's this. The next season, it might be something else. Now, it would be it would be challenging. Paul's called an apostle. That's someone sent out for four years in the prime of his life with all that energy. He's, he's held captive without charges against him. But he looks around and thinks, well, all right, I got, I'm, I'm connected to people who are part of Caesar's household. And he's preaching the gospel to people who live in Caesar's house. He writes to the Philippians and tells them that part of the guard has accepted the Lord and that the gospel's gone into Caesar's house. And so he just took advantage of the opportunities he, he had. And that's where the book of Acts ends, which is a strange way to end. Doesn't it seem sort of anticlimactic or sort of like, wait, where's the rest of it? I want, it, like, I want more. What happened to Thomas? Or where did Matthew go? That we're not, that we're not given that history. We're just given what, uh, what Luke chose to give us. And it's a very narrow view of, uh, a very limited view of, of all that happened I think it's interesting now that we're finished and you can see how much space takes up that last journey uh, what happens when he goes with the offering and all the way to the Rome so it it starts in Jerusalem with the gospel where does it end 
It ends with Paul in Rome at Caesar's preaching the gospel. And so the next chapter, we're writing it. We're living in the rest of the book of Acts. It's, not, it's an open-ended book because it's still happening, and we get to be part of it. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for the table that we were able to sit at, and thank you for being our shepherd, and such a good shepherd, the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep the one who's prepared that table for us in the presence of our enemies. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for making us your own so that we belong to you. And then, Lord, thank you for giving us purpose. Thank you that there's calling on our lives and a purpose for our lives. And I pray that that you, by your Spirit, would awaken us to what you want to do with each one of us. Individually, Lord, we all need to hear from you personally. So speak directly, powerfully to each one of us so that it would be unmistakable uh, what you're wanting to do in us and through us. Open our eyes to the opportunities that we have. Bless us and use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.